Hello, my friends. Yes, it's been a couple weeks, I think, since I've been on here. One of those weeks, I went to get my ministerial credentials taken care of, got that all done. It was good. Last week, I was sick. Yeah. Still working at getting that crud outside of myself. But I was so determined to go on the street today. I prayed and asked God to not make not let me cough during the preaching. And it was a glorious day. Sunshine, blue sky, fluffy white clouds, green, all over green. I, I can't, I'm continually in awe of how God has kept us in a beautiful place, despite all that humanity does against God. So I was thrilled to be out there, gave away one Bible, and the young man seemed very grateful to get it. Um, so I, when I finished with that, I was tired and I found out that rest is the way this time with this being sick and so sometimes it's pretty hard for me to drive up the gumption to get up and go and do something anyway after I came home from preaching on the street I slept some so now I'm at it I'm a little later than usual I have eaten also. So hopefully this will go well. I have also asked God to keep me from coughing too badly. Of course, on this, if I start coughing uncontrollably, I can just nix the whole thing and start over when I feel better. But I'm hoping that we can have a, a very good visit here together. I'm so glad to see you again. We are talking today about the King of the Jews, a very important topic. We're going to read first from Matthew 2 and then Matthew 27. But before we read, we're going to pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for Matthew. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for the stories of Jesus. And we ask that you will help us to understand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will start with Matthew 2, verses 1 to 3. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the one who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Matthew 27 11 to 37, Matthew 27, 11 to 37. Oh, it's 11 and then 27 to 37. Here's Matthew 27, 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, You said it. Now verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had pleaded a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, 
king of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That's the reading of Matthew 2, verses 1 through 3, and Matthew 27, 11, and verses 27 to 37. We played king on the mountain. Any time we came across a little hill as big as a pitcher's mound, or a tractor tire lying on the ground, or a round-topped rock, one of the boys in class would hop on top proclaiming, King on the mountain! The other boys would try to push him off, and whoever did so would stand there proclaiming, proclaiming himself, King on the mountain! Every little hill was an invitation to be king on the mountain. My brother and I did not often engage in contact sports as this was frowned upon by our mother. However, our yard had some very inviting spaces for king on the mountain. We had small tractor tires lying on the ground, standing one foot on each side, made you feel big and powerful over everything you could see. We had a front porch that was big enough to make you feel like you were defending a whole kingdom by keeping the other sibling from coming up. Soon we would hear our mother calling one of us away from the war, and somehow there was no king on the mountain who could stand against her authority. The big issue in the story of Jesus, who had the authority to be king, we are studying words of exactly two instances in Matthew. The phrase, the king of the Jews, is one of those phrases showing up twice, once at the beginning and again at the end of Matthew. From Jerusalem, in the time of Christ, Rome was west, and the wise men came from the east. The Bible does not say where in the east was their origin. It could have been near the southern end of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, or it could have been beyond these rivers. The wise men showed up in Jerusalem with the story that they had followed a star from the east and expected to find and worship the king of the Jews. Herod was king of the Jews. Herod was a descendant of Esau, Israel's brother, not of Israel. Herod received his authority as king of the Jews from Rome. Although he had converted to Judaism, many of the Jews felt he was a usurper of the throne. Therefore, when rich strangers came announcing their intention to find and worship the one-born king of the Jews, Herod took notice. He played along with these strangers with their camel caravan, planning that they would lead him to the newborn king. He gave them the prophetic location of the Messiah's birth and told them to bring him word after they had found the baby. Herod would play for keeps to maintain his position as king on the mountain. When the wise men slipped away by a different route, King Herod mercilessly killed all the babies under two years of age 
to be sure and sweep up the newborn king in the massacre. Herod's authority came from Rome in the West. It clashed with the authority of a star in the East and the prophecies of a Messiah. It was a group of non-Jews coming from the East who first gave Jesus the name King of the Jews. Later, Jesus said people would come from the East and the West into the kingdom. At the other end of the story of Jesus, as told by Matthew, it was the Roman governor with authority from Rome in the West who first gave Jesus the name King of the Jews, albeit in a question. The Roman soldiers took up the name and chanted it shamefully and mockingly. The Roman authority posted Jesus' accusation above his head on the cross, King of the Jews. John in writing his story of Jesus, notes that it was Pilate, the Roman governor, who wrote that notice to be posted on the cross over Jesus' head. Some of Jesus' enemies, who were Jews, said to Pilate, No, don't write that. Instead, write he claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate knew their treachery and refused to change the words. From the way John puts it, I get the idea Pilate walked away from those conniving leaders with disgust. It was a group of non-Jews from the West who gave him the name King of the Jews. However, it was from the East to the West that Jesus said his future coming would shine. From the East, the wise men came looking for the King of the Jews. From the West, the Roman soldiers came to label Jesus the King of the Jews. Jesus did say people would come from the east and the west, and the news would shine from the east to the west. Jesus is king of the Jews. Let us get some Old Testament background for what Jesus as king of the Jews might have meant to Matthew's first readers. When Jehoshaphat, king in Jerusalem, was in trouble, he prayed to the God of the earliest Bible stories and claimed that this God is God in heaven and rules all nations. When Daniel, the young courtier, brought King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation that would save all their lives, he attributed the wisdom of the interpretation to a God in heaven who will set up his kingdom. When that King Nebuchadnezzar later bowed to the rulership of this God, he, the highest king on earth, gave praises to the king of heaven. In the Old Testament, kings and courtiers acclaimed a God who is king in heaven. Several decades after the stories of Jesus happened, John, the author of the revelation of Jesus Christ, was shown a person, quite obviously Jesus, with these names faithful and true, the word of God, and king of kings and lord of lords. As a youth, I pondered what it might mean, king of kings and lord of lords. Of course, they are superlative phrases, and then I realized the simple meaning is that Jesus' authority is higher than all kings and all lords. Jesus is like my mother, able with one call to break up any king on the mountain war going on anywhere. In this nomenclature, king and lord are used as synonyms, meaning the same thing. After the stories of Jesus that Matthew recorded and before John saw Jesus in Revelation, Paul, pictured Jesus as highly exalted by God himself. Paul wrote, or perhaps recorded, a very early hymn that every knee would bow to Jesus and every tongue would declare that he is Lord. We can notice then that scripture announces Jesus as king of much more than the Jews. 
though this was the designation given him by non-Jews at the beginning and ending of Matthew's record. There is a God who rules as king in heaven. This king in heaven is higher in authority than any king or ruler on earth. This king in heaven is higher than my mother was, higher than my neighbor, my teacher, my pastor. This king in heaven is higher in authority and knowledge than I. I do not know all about anything. It would be good if I would keep some humility about what I think is true and imperative. And if I would restrain my willingness to tell other adult people what they should think or do. At the beginning and ending of Matthew, Jesus is called King of the Jews. This fact is a good illustration of Matthew's envelope structure or bookend structure or full circle structure. The wise men came from the east to proclaim him king of the Jews at the beginning of his story as Matthew recorded it. The Roman soldiers came from the west to proclaim him king of the Jews at the end of his story as Matthew recorded it. Jesus said people would, would come from the east and the west and his coming would shine from the east to the west. Jesus is much more than king of the Jews. Thomas had refused to believe that Jesus was alive. Then Jesus came to him and said, touch me and see that I am alive. Thomas bowed his knees and cried out, my Lord, my king, my God, will you come into that cry with me today? My Lord, my King, and my God. I want to pray for us. O oh Lord, O oh King, O oh God, we come to you granting the dominion, the power, the authority, the honor, whatever glory we can give you, because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yet we so often fail to recognize that or to live in such a way. We come to you confessing today, and once again, falling on our knees before you, crying out, Lord, King, and God. We ask your forgiveness, and we thank you for it, because we believe that you bought it for us on Calvary, that Jesus paid the huge price for us. And therefore, you grant us this forgiveness by grace. We thank you for this, and we come to you with our great requests. We ask that you be looking out after your people all over this globe, where there are wars, Stand by the suffering people. Where there are gangs and killings, hear the call of your people. Where there is unrest, where campuses are alive, where, where sometimes it's hard to know who's telling the truth or who to believe. O oh Lord, please stand by us, you as the truth, the way and the life. And where our children are afraid to go to school or where we have troubles with our job, 
or our career or our neighbors. O oh Lord, grant us your presence, your forgiveness, your love. There are some of my friends who are struggling with great grief. I ask for your presence. Some of my friends have, have friends or family a long ways away, or maybe just estranged by a long distance, it seems. And I ask that you would stand in that family. Please bless all the families that are calling on you right now and this week. Bless the children as they go to school, wherever they go. Walk with them and help them to know your love. Lord, we ask that as decisions are made, as nations decide issues, as uh, policies are made that affect many people, I ask that you will have your ambassadors there, helping the decisions that are made to be those that you can use. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come, and we ask that you will guide in that process. We ask that your will may be done here on earth, in our own lives first. And we thank you. We will honor and glorify you throughout eternity for the matchless uh, provision you have made for your people. And so we lift up your name, we praise you, we honor and glorify you, and we grant that yours is the kingdom forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm Wilma Zalabach, and I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches. We are listening is our unity. And yes, I have about six main themes that keep coming to the surface. Um, some people wonder, well, what, what's a hill you would die on? Well, these are they. That's number one, God is love. God is good. Number two, humans have been taken away from good. And number three, Jesus came to bring us back. Number four, I can't do it, but God can, and I decide to let God. Two more. The Bible is worth reading, and the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So hopefully I'll see you next week. Grateful God got me, my voice through this, and we will have another fine time together next week. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you.